from deep in the heart of Texas, Life Talk. Here's your host, Mark Crutcher. Welcome to Life Talk for January 2011. I'm Mark Crutcher, and I'm here with the usual suspects, Cherie Johnson, Johnny Hunter, and Troy Newman. And of course, Father Frank and Janet Morano will be along later. But as always, the first order of business is Alan Ackles with Life Talk News. Alan? All right, thank you, Mark. In 2006, abortionist Romeo Ferrer botched an abortion on Denise Crow at his Gynecare Center abortion clinic in Severna Park, Maryland, and in less than two hours, the young mother and her unborn child were both dead. Now Ferrer has permanently surrendered his medical license and agreed not to seek a license in another state. Crow's death had been kept hidden from the public until the Maryland State Board of Physicians finally took disciplinary action against him. The board said Ferrer was negligent for failing to properly administer anesthesia or monitor the woman during the procedure and for not properly administering resuscitation afterward. Operation Rescue's Troy Newman worked with Maryland pro-life groups to bring attention to the case, and he believes that criminal charges could soon be filed. <clears throat> also in Maryland, health officials have permanently revoked the license of an abortionist who worked for the notorious Stephen Brigham. The license of 88-year-old George Shepard was suspended after a critically injured abortion patient who needed emergency surgery for a perforated uterus was driven to a hospital in a private car. The Maryland board said Shepard was guilty of unprofessional conduct and practicing medicine with an unauthorized person. Shepard worked two days a week at the American Women's Services Abortion Clinic in Elkton. At the same facility, the corpses of 35 late-term unborn children were recently found in a freezer. These babies were eventually buried in a secret ceremony held at the cemetery of the Immaculate Conception Catholic Church. And in a similar story, over 1,000 people attended a funeral at St. Mary's Cathedral in Lansing, Michigan, to bury 17 aborted babies. The dismembered children were laid to rest after being found by local pro-lifers in a trash dumpster used by the Woman's Choice Abortion Clinic. Pro-life leader Monica Miller helped organize subsequent searches of the Lansing dumpster, as well as the dumpster used by the Death Camp Sister Clinic in Saginaw. That effort resulted in the discovery of extensive bloody medical waste, soiled abortion instruments, and numerous patient records. A New Jersey woman who was forced to have an abortion at Planned Parenthood was prohibited from testifying against a bill that would fund the organization. Senator Paul Sarlo would not allow Darlene Dunn to testify and told her that her abortion experience was irrelevant since the funds in question won't be used to fund abortion. When Dunn had attempted to testify, witnesses in the room saw radically pro-abortion Senator Loretta Weinberg, a co-sponsor of the bill, making a gesture in which she put her hand to her head as if she were holding a gun and pretended to pull the trigger. Dunn compared the shabby treatment she received from the committee to the treatment she received from Planned Parenthood, pointing out that in both instances she was manhandled, coerced, and forced to keep her mouth shut. She has since vowed not to be silent anymore. Also in New Jersey, the state assembly voted to restore millions of family planning dollars cut from the budget by Governor Chris Christie. However, the vote was not enough to save a local Planned Parenthood. Trista Brooks, president and CEO of Planned Parenthood of Greater Northern New Jersey, said that the Dover Clinic had been open for over 40 years and would be closing because of the loss of state aid. Marie Tacey of New Jersey Right to Life, who praised Christie's decision to cut funding for clinics this summer, said she encourages the governor to veto these bills again because... They force New Jersey taxpayers to support and expand Planned Parenthood's abortion business. And in Alaska, the Anchorage Superior Court has upheld a state's law requiring parental notification before a minor can submit to an abortion. At the same time, however, the court gutted the penalties that might be levied against those who violate the law. In the final decision, Superior Court Judge John Suddock also shielded abortionists from being liable for damages that might result from not complying with the statute. Jim Minnery of the Alaska Family Council said that he was glad the core of the law is being put into effect, but said the group disagrees with the decision to neuter the statute by eliminating all penalties. The U.S. Second Circuit Court of Appeals has ruled that a Catholic nurse who was forced by a New York hospital to participate in an abortion does not have the right to sue her employer. Alliance Defense Fund attorneys filed suit on behalf of Catherine DiCarlo, who was threatened with disciplinary measures by Mount Sinai Hospital administrators if she did not assist in abortions. The federal suit alleged that Mount Sinai ignored federal laws prohibiting coercion while receiving hundreds of millions of dollars in federal funding. DiCarlo says that her participation in the late-term abortion led to serious emotional trauma. She also claims that hospital administrators later attempted to coerce her into signing an agreement to participate in, uh, in abortions in the future. 
The court found that there is no right to private action or private remedy under the statute cited by DiCarlo in her suit. In Arizona, a Phoenix bishop has threatened to revoke the Catholic status of a hospital that has been found to be participating in abortions. Bishop Thomas Olmsted sent a letter to the president of Catholic Healthcare West, the parent company of St. Joseph's Hospital, following their attempt to justify the killing of unborn children at the hospital. Bishop Olmsted stated that if St. Joseph's Hospital wishes to remain a Catholic hospital, its leaders must pledge that the situation will never happen again. He also stipulated that the hospital staff must be trained on this issue by the Diocesan Medical Ethics Board or the National Catholic Bioethics Center. And recently, an HBO broadcast, uh, HBO that is, broadcast a pro-abortion documentary called Twelfth and Delaware, which smeared the integrity of pro-life crisis pregnancy centers while portraying abortion clinics as pristine examples of first-rate medical care. What the program didn't mention, however, is that at the time of the filming, the abortion clinic featured in the film, A Woman's World in Fort Pierce, Florida, had recently been cited by the state for having no sterile suturing supplies or equipment, no defibrillator, no crash cart, no cardiac monitor, and no program for cleaning surgical instruments. Then, within a week after the film was released, the Florida State Agency for Healthcare Administration inspected the facility and uncovered several additional serious violations of health and safety codes. Among them was that the clinic did not have anyone on staff who was licensed or qualified to monitor patients during and after abortions. Life Dynamics President Mark Crutcher said that the pro-life movement should not hold its breath waiting on HBO to issue an update. <clears throat> and finally, in a follow-up to a previous Life Talk news story, pro-lifers scored a major victory when officials at the University of Wisconsin confirmed that the Madison Surgery Center will not become involved in doing late-term abortions. Led by groups like Pro-Life Wisconsin, the state's pro-life community had been battling the late-term abortion scheme since January 2009. Among the horrors exposed during the campaign were plans to use the university with, uh, to um, supply the university with fresh fetal body parts for use in medical experiments. Peggy Hamill, director of Pro-Life Wisconsin, said the university's decision to pull the program was a validation of her group's findings. Alan Ackles here for Life Talk News. You can get daily news updates by logging on to ProLifeAmerica.com. Mark, back to you. Thanks, Alan. Well, lots of things going on. Um, How can there be so much? I don't know. One I thing I, good news. I want to bring up, uh, yeah, there's a lot of good news. I want to bring up uh, some not so good news of dealing with a lady we've had on me several times on the show before, Eileen Smith. Her daughter was killed by this abortionist in Massachusetts. And I mean, if you read what happened, we've talked about it before, we've gone over the. It was a murder. I mean, you can say oh, what you sure. want to, but it was a. He pled to manslaughter, but it was certainly it was at least murder. second degree, first degree murder. He's out. Yeah. He's out of prison. Slap on the wrist? He got a slap on the wrist to start with, and they didn't even make him go through with the slap on the wrist. You know, we're investigating some of the legal shenanigans that are going on up there. I think that that judge did so illegally. I mean, on its face. What? What? Wait a minute! You're saying he, he did no time at all? What no, he did a little time, a couple, a couple months, couple months what? for but killing this girl. Because wow. he's an abortionist, he walks. Wow. He walks. An abortionist in Massachusetts. If it had been anybody else, he'd still, been be you, he'd, he'd still be in prison. He'd still be in prison. But he's an abortionist, he's a baby killer, mm -hmm. and he's in, in a godless state like Massachusetts, he walks. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess you could say they probably come, walk in Texas, they, but they've, they've come a little further than back in the day when uh, Kennedy let Mary Jo uh, die Kennedy, in, the, yeah. in the river. Not much. <laughs> um, anyway, this, this is outrageous. And of course, Eileen is very upset about this. I and would be too. and um, she asked the judge, where is my daughter's freedom to go home? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's in, she's in the ground forever. So the sanctity of life doesn't, it's not only just the child, but it's also the woman. Mm -hmm. They could care less. They could yeah. not possibly care less than they do. Life is cheap. That's and sick. of course the media is just ignoring it. And you know, I want, I want to talk a few minutes here about some things to do in, in the media that's happened over the last month. You know, we've, we've said here before, or I've said many times before, all of us know in, in the Christian community, in the pro-life community, in the pro-family community or whatever, that the American media is a bunch of godless degenerates who have a particular world view. It creates a particular political agenda and they use world events to, to advance that agenda. We know that about them. Mm -hmm. We know they're pathological liars. Right, and they're spoon feeding it to the American people. And yet, pro-lifers, when something comes up, 
often are the first people that believe what the media tells them, <laughs> you know? And it, I, I've been the victim of that. I'm sure y'all have sure. been the victim of that too. Particularly I, when it's an attack on a fellow Christian or right. pro-lifer. Um, we saw uh, recently where the media got all euphoric over Pope Benedict coming out and saying that he approved of condoms for male prostitutes. You remember that? Right. I even got calls from, from uh, some of our people wrong on so many levels, but go ahead. Well, it is, mm -hmm. if, it, if that's what had happened. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. Oh. And uh, I got calls from people saying, you know, you need to be talking to Father Frank and all these other Catholics, right. and you, somebody needs to get a hold of the Pope and say, what, what were you thinking saying this? Well, the fact is, he never said that. Sure. Oh, thank and, really. But so many Christians were so quick even, even Christians, particularly non-Catholic Christians, right. were quick to jump on the Pope right. for having said that one that it is acceptable for male prostitutes to right. use condom. Here's what the Pope said. Here's the quote. There may be a basis in the case of some individuals, as perhaps when a male prostitute uses a condom, where this can be a first step in the direction of remoralization, a first assumption of responsibility on the way toward recovering an awareness that not everything is allowed and that one cannot do whatever one wants but it is not really the way to deal with the evil of HIV infection. That can really lie only in a humanization of sexuality. That's a completely different statement right. Right. than what the media said mm -hmm. sure. and what so many people were so quick to, to glum on to as, as saying the Pope shouldn't have been saying this, this is wrong, what's the matter with this guy? He never said what the media said he right. said. Misquoted and misdirected. No, 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 Johnny, it's not a misquote. It's you a lie. <laughs> There's no way you can well, read how that. How can they get away with it? <laughs> it what about the, all about of it. the uh, impartial? What but happened to the those The reason rules? they can get away with it because the media is supposed to be the watchdog for the society, mm -hmm. but nobody's watching the watchdog. Mm -hmm. And these people can get away with whatever they want to get away with because just what we just now did right here in exposing their lie, no one else is doing out there. No one took the time that I heard anyway, and I watch, I'm a news junkie. I watch a lot of it. I never heard anyone say, well, read the quote. Let me hear what he actually said. Mm -hmm. Because when I first heard it, I thought, no, no, you can't be. That's what I thought when you just said it. Right. I, I can't yeah. believe it. There's a reason why we have sayings like take <coughs> things with a grain of salt. Right. You know, when you hear the media say anything, just assume, number one, they're it's lying. Lie. It's, they're lying. Okay. Right. It, it's an absolute lie. And so don't believe them. Don't right. listen to them. Right. Mock them. Right. And, um, it, 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 but, and, uh, and, you know, the chances of the media ever coming out and saying, oh, we, we made a mistake and, or, or somebody, in our, we, somebody lied and we picked no, up on it, it's never going to happen. Right. Um, something else to show a, a little bit, uh, not only do, are we guilty of doing the same thing, when I say we, the Christian community and the pro-life community, of believing what the media tells us, despite the fact that we know they're pathological liars. And we've, again, this is something else we've talked about here before, and that is the naivete of, the, of so many pro-lifers. And I think it's driven by the fact that they want to be nice people. They, they want to believe the best, and they, right. they want to think that even our most staunch enemies are good people. We saw a good example of this recently when Elizabeth Edwards died of uh, breast cancer, or, or cancer, I think it was breast cancer. And all of a sudden now, you're hearing all these even pro-life conservative Christian people say, oh, she was such a nice lady. I hate that. And she was, um, you know, that she died of breast cancer and that, you know, she had this problem and she had that problem. She seemed like such a nice person and she was really sweet. Done wrong. No, she wasn't. This woman was a rabid pro-abort. Oh, yeah. She was not a nice person. Just because she died of breast cancer didn't convert her from the moral degenerate she was the day before she died of breast cancer into a nice person. And I know this sounds harsh, and I hate being the one who always is kind of the, the party pooper here. <laughs> no. But the fact is, this was not a nice person. This was a horrid person. You know, I've got some personal experience with Elizabeth Edwards myself. We were doing a picket during the presidential primaries back several years ago. And uh, along came John Edwards' motorcade, and he popped out, and he was waving, and he was smiling. <clears> and we were giving <throat> him uh, what for about his position on child killing. And Elizabeth Edwards stepped in front of John Edwards and began to rail against the pro-lifers with some really unspeakable language and 
uh, and and just vile, almost spit throwing mm -hmm. uh, uh, epitaphs against us. And I was quite frankly shocked at how mean and vile she was. Now, I don't want anybody to die of breast cancer, and it was a tragic right. mm -hmm. disease, and I'm sure she underwent a lot of suffering. And I pray at the end that she did uh, come to grips with uh, what she's done and and uh, with her maker. You know, really. If not, but, we know where she is. Well, either way, we know where she is, one way or the other. Well, in North Carolina, that was one of the biggest stories there was, and everybody was watching the funeral and all because uh, this one church showed up, and they were actually protesting at her funeral. And um, and if you listen to what those people were saying, and I just said, mm, they just said it too late because she can't hear you now, brother. Mm -hmm. um, but they were really being, they were being very adamant. They said, listen, God tried to warn this woman, mm -hmm. and she still didn't listen. Right. And they said, uh, and, and somebody said, well, what about the council? Those people was tough. They were saying, well, sometimes God give us God smacks. Right. And, and she had it once before. It went in remission. She had it again. Right. But, and they named it, they listed the things that she supported. Mm -hmm. And that group was adamant. I just wish they had done it before mm -hmm. she passed away. But what got, got me, when you talk about the nicety of people, people came to the <laughs> funeral to protest the group that was protesting her. Oh, gosh. <laughs> That was the biggest part, part of the news story wow. in North Carolina. Yeah. Well, you know, Johnny, we were talking yeah. about uh, people that were lying. Uh, you would think, of course, the media lies, their lips move. Mm -hmm. Abortionists lie whenever oh. their lips are moving, really? right? And so it, not only when their lips are moving are they lying, but when they're writing, uh, they're lying as well. Uh, recently, uh, Leroy Carhart of the infamous, you know, Carhartt versus right. Stenberg yeah. fame and Gonzalez versus Stenberg, the, the partial birth abortionist. Tiller Jr., right? He worked with George Tiller for at least 10 years. He applied for a medical license in Maryland, and he wants to open up an abortion clinic there. And so he has to make this <coughs> full-blown 37-page written application of his entire medical history. And when we read this, we applied for a Freedom of Information Act and, and read his medical uh, license application. He is listed as an emergency room physician and a university professor. Not one mention in 37 pages of him being an abortionist. And he's a university professor and, uh, and a, 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 an emergency room physician. But he doesn't have hospital privileges and never has had hospital privileges anywhere. And as far as his university professorship, it's just in name only at the University of Nebraska. And so we filed a, a complaint against him, and we received confirmation from the medical board that they're going to investigate this. And, you know, I mean, it's one of those things you kind of hold your breath. But we're, put, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to put the pressure on, and we're going to follow this through. Because if the most notorious, think about this, if the most notorious abortionist in the entire world is ashamed of calling himself an abortionist and wants to hide it from the medical they're board, mm -hmm. you know, there's something wrong. Absolutely. Speaking of nice people. Um, some feminist, uh, what is her name? Let's see, because I wasn't familiar with her. Florence Thomas, you know her? I never heard of her before this. Um, she was, you know, doing her thing in France and in the 60s, free love and all that business. And um, she got pregnant and she referred to her unborn child as a tumor mm -hmm. and was relieved to get the tumor removed. And then she could go on with her life. And uh, she said, this tumor went away, disappeared. I could get back to living. And she's famous for the claim that women should be permitted to terminate the lives of their unborn children whenever the child isn't desired by the mother because, are you ready for this? You know, I get here, I think I've heard it all, and I just I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Because the love of the mother is what humanizes the fetus. Yeah, let's so all, let's all lift our lift our legs. We're on holy ground now. You know, well, what, that minute, deep is so deep. But Cherie, if that's true, and I and I read that quote, and it, it it is amazing with the the delusion that these people are under, um, self delusion and intentional self intentional self delusion. Mm -hmm. If it's the mother's love that humanizes the unborn child or the fetus, mm -hmm. what about the women in this world who don't love their children? And there there are those out there. Well, then they're not human. The baby, the baby. If they're three human. years old and the mother's never loved them, they still never. They're not human yet, so you can kill them. It's getting there, don't you think? It's getting. It there? is getting there, and it. Well, Peter Peter uh, Singer from Princeton, oh, yeah. the ethicist there, so-called ethicist. <laughs> I'm sure that he would agree with you, Mark. He because does because he's the most consistent, rabid pro board out there. He's the intellectually there. honest one. Yep. Mm -hmm. Kill them in the womb. He kill says you can kill them up to a year after they're born, right. and he's he's made the argument, if. If, if we're going to say that a woman has the right to choose right. when the baby's unborn, how does that change when the baby becomes born? She should still have the right to choose. Mm -hmm. 
He is at least, among all the godless pro boards in this country, he is at least the one who's intellectually honest. He's, he's got it right. He's got it more right than most pro-lifers do because he sees no distinction between an unborn child and a born child. He sees no distinction for, between them. And then this one kind of surprised me. I don't watch this, but isn't she a TV judge, Judge Pirro? Right. And um, I'm guessing she's Italian, which may make her Catholic. And um, But a, a woman on her show sued a boyfriend, sued her boyfriend uh, for, for um, medical bills when she had this baby. And the guy, the boyfriend's argument was, well, I gave her a way out. I was going to pay for her abortion. So he's off the hook. He's off the hook. Which is an argument we've made time and time again. That a man, we've got to the point now where a man's responsibility to the one he impregnates is the willingness to pay for half the abortion and give her a ride to the clinic, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, but, it, yeah. It, but I was surprised at the judge because she blasted him for his pro-abortion mentality. But yeah, well, she the, yeah, she did. But the but the guy can't go to the fire station and say, right. I'm done. Well, yeah, you know? we've talked about that here before too, the baby Moses thing where these states now are like Texas. A woman, in, the, the, the motive behind it is pure. They don't want these women throwing these babies in garbage dumpsters after they're born and so forth. So they say, look, if you don't want your baby, take it to a fire station or a police station. They won't even have to have your name. Just say, I want to give up my rights to this baby, and you can walk away. Amen. There's going to be a challenge on this one day, just like on this situation right here, that, on this mm -hmm. Judge Pirro uh, thing. There's going to be a challenge one day when a man says, look, here's my girlfriend. She's pregnant over here. I'm going to go to the fire station and say, look, I relinquish all my rights and responsibility to this baby. Why can't he walk away? If she can walk away mm -hmm. from, from her parental responsibilities, why can't a man? Because the so-called feminists like that woman right there have right. saw, are their man-hating, uh, rabid, pro-abortion right. people, and if they don't get their way, they go whine, and they are, they are going to nail the man to the wall in whatever way they can because it's their fault. Let and me tell you something that... Um, that I found really interesting here, uh, because this is this is truth in its purest form. Uh, Supreme Court Justice Anthony Scalia was giving a speech or a talk on the issue of interpreting the Constitution and why you can't have the Constitution be a so-called living document so that new people can come along and interpret it any way they want to. He says if you do that, if you view the Constitution as a living document, he said, quote, that means that five out of nine hotshot lawyers can run the country. Unquote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you got nine Supreme Court justices, right? right? Five of those hotshot lawyers, as he called them, can run the country if you view the Constitution right. as a living document. Didn't Gore first come up with that, that it's a living document? No, no, Gore wasn't the first one. He, he was just. the internet. No, oh, yeah, okay. he's in the internet <laughs> and the airplane or something. You know, Mark, in regards to that, it amazes me the people that want to change the world want two things they want uh, a living, breathing U.S. Constitution and they want a living, breathing Bible. Bible. Right. The two mm -hmm. things that are immutable that cannot be changed. They shouldn't be. Should not They be. can change them because they do change them. And in their, and it's, and in their and minds. The more they water down the Word of God and the U.S. Constitution, the further down the slope America gets. And there's no gets, accountability. Right? That if if uh, Bible says how we're to live and not to live, mm -hmm. and we water it down to make it how we want it to be, mm -hmm. you, know, what, you know, we can do whatever we want. Yeah. Once no you reach that point, the Bible has no more relevance than a book that I might write or Johnny might write or any of us might write. Just write a little pamphlet. It has as much relevance as the Bible if the Bible is this living, flexible document like the Constitution, as these people claim. And one thing that, that um, Scalia made a point of, which I've often wondered why we didn't hit harder on this in the, in the legal community. He's talking about uh, the, the liberty created in the 14th Amendment. And he says now that's been used to justify...